In order to access the shiny gold bindings, Hollow Knight's second hardest in-game achievement, the player will have to complete the 42 boss Pantheon of Hollow Nest, with all four bindings, equipped at the same time. While this is a massive handicap and makes basically every boss exponentially harder, there are four particular bosses which skyrocket beyond anything else. If you're interested in completing the Pantheon of Hollow Nest with all bindings, you probably already know which bosses these are. They're the Collector, Markoth, Zote, and the Absolute Radiance. Mastering these bosses will likely require substantial practice, however in this video I'll try to provide simple tips and easily to execute strategies to help mitigate their challenge as much as possible. The Collector in Pantheon 5 Albidigs is significantly more difficult than the Pantheon 3 Albidigs version. Firstly, the minions are much harder, such as Primal Aspids. Also, the minions will now take two ticks of the Cyclone Slash to kill instead of one. Despite this, the Cyclone Slash is still the best option. Firstly, it can damage multiple minions much more easily than any other nail attack. Second, it's much better for soul generation, which is extremely useful in this fight. In case you don't already know, Cyclone Slash can be extended by mashing attack after you release the nail art. Furthermore, the player can still walk around with Cyclone Slash active. This makes Cyclone Slash essentially a giant contact hitbox for the player. During the later phases of the fight, try to start the Cyclone Slash between two falling jars if that's possible. It's important to discuss Primal Aspids specifically. Don't be knocked back by the Cyclone Slash if they're on the edge of the hitbox. For this reason, you should try to get relatively close to falling jars before you activate it. If the Primal Aspid starts inside the hitbox, it will die very quickly. However, if it's on the edge and is pushed back, you should not try to pursue it. Like I said, Soul Generation is a major benefit of Cyclone Slash. The Descending Dark spell is extremely good at stabilization in the Collector fight. Its deceptively massive hitbox can often completely clear a crowded field of enemies. Shade Soul is a bit less useful, however it can still one-shot Collector's minions. So, if some of them did survive and they're far away, you could retreat to the edge and use a Shade Soul. I recommend performing a small jump, this will keep it low enough to clip the boulders, but still high enough to probably destroy anything else. Use Descending Dark instead if they're even remotely close or are between you and the edge. When you do stagger the Collector, if none of the minions are still around, you could use the Dream Nail to get Soul. I recommend using this for a powerful Abyss Streak attack since you'll likely replenish your soul almost immediately on the next wave if you're using Cyclone Slash. You can also use the soul to heal. If something ever goes not to plan, just keep calm and definitely don't sacrifice multiple masks just to take out one minion. Markoth is exactly as fun as you remember him, which is to say not fun at all. There's not that many tips for this fight, but general familiarity will really be your best friend. However, as always, the best advice I can give is to use Great Slashes and also make sure you activate them while he's still out of range. This is super important, because due to the shield's orbital radius, if you wait until he's in rage, there's a super good chance you'll get bonked. However, if you use the Great Slash while he's out of range, half of the time he'll just fly into it. If he doesn't, then at least you don't get hit. Make sure to only attack, which includes attacking with spells, after each of his swords is already locked into a trajectory and you've already avoided it. Otherwise, there's a very good chance you'll get hit. This is also your safe window to reposition. The safest time to attack Markoth is during the shield spin, but definitely don't rely on this completely for damage. If you do, the fight will last way too long, and that's very dangerous. When he does go to do the shield spin, wait for the shield to circle twice before you move in. If he starts the attack on the opposite side of the center platform relative to you, don't move in unless he's above the top platform. Otherwise, if he's close to the center, use the dash slash before or after the shield spinning and then retreat. If he's too far away to dash slash, then just don't attack. Don't attack at all if he's on the opposite side of the center and also below the bottom platforms. If you, for completely understandable reasons, would prefer not to deal with Zote, then just do it on a file where you haven't fought him yet at Breda's basement. It counts if the game counts it. The main mechanical change with Zote is the fact that the minions will now require two nail hits to kill. A lot of players like to take them out by using an Abyss Shriek as soon as they spot in. It's an okay strategy, but if you're focusing on the minions with the Abyss Shriek, it's probably not going to damage the boss. As with the Collector, it's very important not to sacrifice masks unnecessarily. 
again, don't rabidly attack the Bayids if they survive the Abyss Streak or whatever other method you use to kill them. Using Descending Darks is great in the fight. It'll get you out of almost every tricky situation and also do decent damage to the boss. For the dreaded fakeout attack, all you have to do is perform a second dash as soon as you see it. If you're close enough, you don't actually have to dash at all, but I'd recommend sticking to dashes while you're still getting the hang of it. The explosive zones will require three nail hits to blow up. That means you can safely hit them twice. This is great for gathering soul as well as pushing them into a better spot. Healing is safe on the staggers if there's no minions around. It's safe the majority of the time if there's a frog zone around, but very unlikely to be safe if there's a flag zone. You can also heal on the explosive zone attack. It works some of the time, but it's fairly dangerous and I wouldn't recommend it unless you absolutely have to. The best way to deal with that attack, if possible, is to use a descending dark before they blow up. That will always give you time to react to whatever happens next. As always, a tip for every phase of Absolute Radiance which features wall attacks is to dodge the wall before it reaches the halfway point. If it reaches the halfway point, then Absolute Radiance can begin a second attack, and you might have to deal with two attacks in combination. For the spike floor phase, you could use a Descending Dark to temporarily get rid of the spikes. This is super useful if Absolute Radiance's teleportation pattern is keeping her above the spikes and safe from your attacks. You could use the Descending Dark before the spikes have fully spawned in, as long as your 0.4 second invincibility frame window hasn't ended by the time they've fully appeared. While the Absolute Radiance is difficult, its saving grace is how easy it is to heal. There's two spots which are 100% safe. First, on the beam burst attack, after you've lined yourself up to be safe from the third burst, you could heal. Also, on the downward swords, once you've lined yourself up to dodge the last set, you could heal. These are no longer safe, of course, if the ground spikes spawn under you. During phase 3, if an empty area spawns on top of you, you could also use this chance to heal. This is super useful because it will let you top off your health before going into phase 4. Despite phase 4 being mechanically difficult, it's possibly the easiest phase to stabilize on. Not only does the beam burst heal from before still apply, but the timing is actually easier since the beam burst is slower in phase 4. You could also heal on the sword burst after you've lined yourself up to dodge the last set of swords. It also helps a lot to make use of great slashes in this phase. While the Great Slash is worse than regular attacks in terms of theoretical DPS, if you're anyway dodging the boss, you might as well use that chance to charge up a Great Slash. This is particularly true in Phase 4, since you really should only be attacking the Absolute Radiance if she's either in the center or on the platforms right next to the center. For the climb, it's important to maximize your reaction window. This is done by jumping in rhythm with the beams. You should jump immediately after you hear a beam's hitbox activate. That will give you the maximum possible time to react to the next beam's positioning. There's several strategies for the final phase, but the one I'll recommend is called the Parallelogram. Dash left as a fireball approaches, double jump up, and then dash slash right back in. Rinse and repeat. When exactly to dash out is not tight at all and will always lead the fireball off screen. It also requires as little brain power as possible, which is a very good thing since you'll be very nervous by this point of the road. While it's extremely easy, it is ever so slightly harder than it looks, so I definitely recommend practice to get a few times in the Hall of Gods before you go in. So that was the video, I hope you find these tips useful. Thanks for watching and I wish you the best of luck on Pantheon 5 All Bindings.